Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, challenge to the conference was laid out so clearly by uh, Professor Kotlikoff just a few minutes ago. And what's happening this morning is that we're having a response, firstly, from three distinguished politicians. And then later in the morning, we're having a response from business. I just wish, I have to say, we could have had a round table with the president and Professor Kotlikoff, because I think, uh, to me, uh, when Professor Kotlikoff started, he said, this is the greatest moral issue we face. It's not simply political or economic. And secondly, I would love to have discussed or to have questioned uh, the president about what Switzerland in its history has to contribute to this debate on the cl clash of generations. In particular, um, for example, in 19th century Britain, uh, we had governments of varying political persuasions which had balanced budgets. We never passed a law saying we needed a balanced budget. It came out of the culture. And I just wonder uh, to what extent the culture of Switzerland, here in St. Gallen, 1929, you have limits on debt and so on. You also have direct democracy. To what extent these are factors in actually mitigating uh, the clash of uh, generations? And I hope we can come back and discuss some of these issues. To what extent we have, can have a political response, to what ex an immediate political response, short term, to what extent we need constitutional amendments in order to have more rules and less discretion for politicians. Let me just briefly uh, introduce the panel, if I may. On my immediate left is Professor Kuniko Inoguchi. I hope I pronounced that properly. Uh, who, is, who is a member at present of the House of Councillors of the National Diet of Japan, was formerly a member of the Cabinet, uh, as the Minister for Gender Equality uh, and Social Affairs. Then on her left is Laza Kristish, who is the Minister of Finance uh, in the Republic of Serbia. Uh, he's extremely young, he's only 30 years of age. Um, it's great to welcome you, he has a background in McKinsey uh, and in economic research on the transition in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And then on my extreme left is Cesar Purissima, uh, who is the Secretary of the Philippine Department of Finance, again with a background in business and with a background in public administration. The form of this session is, I'm going to ask each member of the panel, in the order I introduce them, to speak for three to five minutes uh, on their um, uh, view on the issue. And I think one of the most difficult problems in being a chairman is when people overstep the mark. I don't have a cowbell here to ring, but I do have a, a white handkerchief. And if I pull out the white handkerchief and hold it up, it'll be a sign of surrender as a chairman to the panelists. So if you see the white handkerchief coming out, please do take account of it. After they've introduced the subject, we're going to have a brief discussion among ourselves, and then we're opening it up to questions and answers. Could I ask you, please be as brief as you can in the question. So first of all, I'm going to turn to Professor Inoguchi. Well, thank you so much. I really indeed thank Lord Griffiths for giving me this floor. And also, I would like to thank able organizers of this very important symposium, very thematic, uh, thematically very important symposium and, and inviting me to this place. Um, I would first of all like to thank uh, the President of the Swiss Federation, President Ubu uh, for his very kind and successful visit to Japan February 6th this year to uh, celebrate the 150th anniversary of diplomatic ties between uh, Japan and Switzerland. Um, it was exactly 150 years ago in February that a delegation from Switzerland came to Japan to sign a treaty of commerce. And uh, I am delighted to inform you that the head of the delegation was a man from the city of St. Gallen. Yeah. 
um, the professionals uh, from Sangalen have, uh, throughout history, it made uh, many uh, innovative moves and uh, embraced innovative worldviews, in my view. Uh, they came to Japan to help us modernize and also have some good business with Japan. And I'm sure there are many descendants of those people and friends of those people in this room today. And very happy to be here. Um, I have actually read uh, this uh, Clash of Generation book, a very uh, excellent book written by Professor Kotrikov, um, very provo provocative one. Um, if anything, uh, well, he uh, discusses a lot about the United States, but if anything, Japan goes beyond the United States in terms of younger generation having to bear uh, heavier burdens um, to sustain an aging uh, society. Now, I would like to state at the outset that the worst clash of generations that could come is the absence of clash of generations because simply there will be no generations to come. Uh, very difficult to have children, um, uh, decreasing of total fertility rate because for young people there is there's this uh, weirdness of very complicated civilization that gives them no job, no hope, no sustain sustainable outlook, no economic allowances or, or, or opportunities. So it has become increasingly difficult in Japan, uh, particularly for women, to have both work and family. Um, I became gender equality minister for Mr. Koizumi uh, in 2005 and served for a year or, or, or two uh, in that uh, capacity. At that time, uh, the total fertility rate was 1.26, and he was so alarmed that he decided to establish this ministerial post to uh, cope uh, to see how uh, the long-term decline trend can be reversed. Uh, it was very difficult, but today we have total fertility rate of 1.41. So at least I, have, uh, uh, I was able to uh, reverse the trend to a certain extent, if not dramatically. <laughs> uh -huh. um, There are many things you can do. First of all, to mainstream the idea that women's and children's issues are the most important issue for the country. Many people thought it's something to be set aside. It's relegated to the periphery of all policy debate. But I told them, the demography is the most valuable and important element in economics if you want to have growth. So we have to address gender equality, work-life work balance, a mainstreaming of those ideas, and also uh, put greater emphasis to uh, public spending to education and childcare. So today we have finally overcome the waiting list for child care centers and more women are coming into uh, office uh, in decision making uh, uh, levels so that the gender gap in terms of uh, income has decreased. So more women, uh, uh, more young families are now being able to have both work and family and, and uh, uh, don't have to choose. Of course, there's many uh, paternalistic ideas behind, very difficult to fight, but anyways, uh, I think we have set some um, um, course there. Now, we have uh, the longest longevity uh, in the whole world, Japan. People live very long, so it's a good, good thing. Uh, but uh, uh, the burden of the younger generation is very big. Now, about the clash of generations. So the young people are very upset. There is this syndrome of angry citizens. People are very angry, so they go for small parties that says everything bad about establishment or established parties. So both LDP, I come from LDP, but both LDP and DPJ, the Democratic Party of Japan, both established parties have a very difficult time. But then those small parties don't last long, so there is a political instability there. Um, well, we have many problems, but... Um, I will end my talk by uh, telling you that there are good things that older generations have done to younger generations. First of all, Japan enjoyed long peace. We had peace for more than 60 years, and we had growth. 
So that's something that the older generation has given to the young children. We have long longevity, and of course we have near full employment, except it, it was without women, and now we are collecting it. So, so those are the uh, <laughs> things that uh, <laughs> older generation have given us. Now, if we are having this budget crisis with uh, aging population and uh, uh, younger generation have to bear uh, those uh, 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 burden, uh, there are some solutions. Uh, where well, you can raise tax, we have just done that. The consumption tax is being raised from 5% to 8%. 1% of that is earmarked for, uh, for, for children and women. So those are the things you can do if you successfully mainstream the argument. The argument is very important. Okay? And second thing, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the solution, I call it, is, is, uh, is this. It's geriatric peace. Oh, oh, you're surrendering. OK. I, I feel okay. I've fallen as a, at the first fence of this race. <laughs> OK, I will leave this geriatric peace to the later discussion. But it's not between gun or butter, but it's with between gun and medicine. So we will finally um, stop uh, fighting wars and use a budget for social security and social policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Christich. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. President, uh, Lord Griffiths, uh, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my uh, honor to be here, and it's also a pleasure. It's my first time in St. Gallen. Um, I like it quite so much that um, I'm now thinking Maybe I can apply for the leaders of tomorrow since I'm still <laughs> eligible <laughs> um, this year. But um, I certainly hope it's, uh, it's uh, not the last time uh, I'm here. And uh, I hope that this discussion that we're having today is, uh, um, uh, is one that we can kind of move the needle on. But I'm sure it's going to be around for, um, for quite a while. Uh, let me start with a, with a bit of a personal story. Uh, when I was in my late teens, which was not so long ago, so beginning of the 2000s, those of you who know the history of Serbia, especially the rec more recent one, will, will especially understand this, um, uh, I coined this, uh, this notion in my head that it would have been great had I been born somewhere around 1948 and lived a full and short life and um, sort of Stop it somewhere around 1990 or so. The, uh, I would have been there for Woodstock and uh, a number of other things that I've otherwise missed. Um, uh, and now, especially after Professor Kotlikov's um, address, um, I'm even more convinced that um, that might have not been such a bad notion after all. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, instead, uh, here I am, uh, the, the Minister of Finance, probably the, the youngest, definitely the youngest in Serbia's history, I, uh, when I became at the age of 28, um, at an interesting juncture point for our country uh, that is faced, I think, with uh, um, all the similar challenges, all the same challenges, I should say, as, uh, as the rest of all Europe, and no pun intended here, um, except a little bit um, uh, to a greater degree, probably. Um, the, uh, uh, the anxiety about young age, the anxiety about the old age are both there, especially in Serbia. Uh, we have one of the uh, oldest populations uh, in the world uh, and on the continent with a median age of uh, about 42. We have um, uh, the majority of the uh, population, not to mention the majority of the electorate, actually above the age of 55. We have the, among the lowest retirement ages in, uh, in Europe, for sure, it's at 60 and 65 for women and men, respectively. On the flip side, we have, uh, not unlike many European countries these days, um, the, uh, many other European countries these days, very high uh, youth unemployment and the overall unemployment rate as well. So. Um, the, um, I think the challenges are pretty clear and well identified. The urgency for acting in Serbia, if anything, is greater, I should say, than, than in some other places. And I think it is a bit of a twist of uh, circumstances and uh, fate, if you want, that somebody who is of the age of below 30, which is that category for the cutoff for, for youth unemployment, at least in Serbia, 
is um, uh, uh, is in the seat of of, uh, of the Ministry of Finance trying to solve a seven percent budget deficit, uh, most of which, which is actually in its totality smaller than the transfers to the um, to the pension fund uh, in our pay-as-you-go system. So. Um, I think uh, if I abstract from, from that particular situation and move sort of towards, um, towards the, the, global, the global issue, I think it's clear how we got here. We had the Industrial Revolutions, then we had Dickens, then we had Bismarck fix uh, some things or start to fix some things. But now here we are with an aging population, the, um, uh, the medicine kind of reaching the new, um, uh, the new highs, the technology breakthroughs, same time, we have the global global resource constraints uh, that uh, that are pressing on a number of issues, including uh, uh, obviously the climate change, and we have uh, here in Europe, I think, competition from Asia as well, in particular Southeast Asia. That is um, uh, that is another thing to to be considered. So, uh, I think all of these all of these challenges there are conventional. Uh, conventional solutions that uh, a latecomer to the party uh, uh, in, in kind of reforming the system as, as is Serbia needs to do, but I also think that there we will need, um, and I think international institutions will have to play a role in this, uh, much in the same way that they did, uh, for instance, in the Bretton Woods uh, conference in that way, we will need to find uh, a new social compact almost globally um, to, to address all of these issues. Um, do I think it's a clash? I think it's a clash. Do I think it needs to be destructive? Uh, probably not, as long as we're talking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Purusima. Mr. President, uh, Lord Griffith, uh, fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm a brand new father. And Professor, I cannot, uh, for the life of me, imagine being at war with my three-and-a-half-month-old uh, uh, son. I can imagine, though, uh, waging a war uh, for him, waging a war against poverty, against corruption, against inefficiency, so that they can have a better uh, uh, future. I think perspective is very important in this uh, topic, and I would like to think that uh, rather than thinking of a clash, we should think of ourselves as stewards for future generations to make sure that what we inherited we can pass on in a better state than when we got it. In the case of the Philippines, um, during the generation of our parents and our grandparents, we were only second to Japan in development in Asia. And for the next 40 or so years, because of bad governance, we slid back to probably the bottom in our region. And fortunately for us, in 2010, we had a president who ran on a platform of better governance. Governance as a basis for a better economy. And the past four years has proven the fact that you can actually improve the lot of our people and realize the potential of our uh, country. And uh, the past four years, uh, we've averaged a growth of 6.3%. Uh, uh, no? But we have substantial issues, different from what was written in the book, because we are about to enter a demographic sweet spot. We're the youngest country in Asia, average age of about 23 uh, years old. Our problems is different. It's not about pension costs, that's not book. It's about more basic things, making sure that the youth are educated, are given the skills, are healthy, so that they can become productive participants in the future Philippine economy. And that is why uh, we are right now waging a war so that we can give them a better future. Waging a war against corruption, with, I, which I think is at the root of uh, poverty issues. Waging a war against uh, health issues, making sure that uh, we give them access to uh, health care. That is the biggest challenge of the Philippines, making sure that we build the right infrastructure so that we can uh, connect our country to global supply chain, so that we can uh, be as efficient as our uh, neighbors, making sure that we build institutions that would encourage meritocracy so that we can pass on a government that is in a better shape to the next uh, uh, generation. The other big challenge that we face, especially countries in coastal regions, is climate change. I think that is the bigger 
uh, intergenerational challenge that we must all uh, face up to, whether climate change is for real or not, whether typhoons like the one we face is the new normal or not, I think one thing's for sure, that the extremes of weather is happening more often. For example, in the case of the Philippines, of the three deadliest typhoons in our history, three happened the last three years, two happened last year. I think it is our responsibility in our generation to make sure that we wage a, far, a, a fight against uh, uh, pollution, against those uh, uh, damaging the economy. We wage a fight to move to a greener economy. I think these are the bigger issues that cut across countries. No? Demography, I think some countries are getting old, but many countries are young. <clears throat> and I think as part of globalization, we must realize that the solution to this is not in creating silos within countries, but in realizing that some have strengths, some have uh, weaknesses, and some can offer solutions to one another. So since we globalize movement of trade, mm. we must, I think, be more open to globalization of movement of people, so that then we can truly help each other. For example, in healthcare cost, Philippines is one of the biggest exporters of healthcare workers. It's a major cost issue, say, in the United States. Why not create portability of medical insurance so that they can have treatment in lower cost uh, uh, countries such as the Philippines? I think simple solutions like this with a different approach, an approach that is more global, an approach that is more cooperative, I think will allow us to fulfill our responsibility of being stewards for future generations. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask each member of the panel one separate question. Quick answer, please, not long. Uh, and then I'm going to throw it open for discussion. Uh, to the professor on my immediate left, Nico, please. Uh, uh, the question is, if you had just one policy to deal with what you see as the angry side and the clash of generations in uh, Japan, what would it be? To Mr. Krisich, the question, you mentioned the role international institutions may play. You mentioned the role of Bretton Woods. Any idea you have on that? Uh, and thirdly, for Mr. Purishima, I'd be very interested. You traveled a lot in America, in Europe, in Japan. Um, what is your observation, as you see it, of the one thing we should be doing to deal with the clash of civilization. So, so one, um, Professor Inoguchi, what is the one policy? If you said to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, there's one policy I want you to do. What would it be? Okay. Um, that is. Sorry, this isn't an exam, by the way. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> No, I'm you not, see. I'm not reverting to my role as a teacher here in, in putting it to you. Um, you could be an economist because <laughs> economists always ask for one answer. <laughs> but when you deal with social problems, you need package of solutions because people have difficulties in very different ways. Very good. All right. Okay. So I will. That's, that's a rebuke to <laughs> yeah. the chairman. All right. <laughs> package of ideas. Now I'm dealing with social problems that our young people in Japan are facing. Okay, a package, problem, a pa package of solutions will be more focus allowances to younger generation, um, higher public spending for education, as uh, somebody uh, has already mm. said. Uh, in Japan, parents are supposed to finance uh, kids' education, and therefore, as the discrepancy of income of parents grow, then the disparity of uh, educational opportunities also grow. Also, where you're born, whether you're born in Tokyo or you're born somewhere in Kagoshima, makes a total difference today. It wasn't like that um, when we had like, uh, something like Meiji Restoration many years ago when we had this uh, bilateral uh, diplomatic ties. So higher educational cost, um, shorter working hours, so that also, not only women, but men also, 
uh, can have um, personal life, family participation, taking care of kids. Uh, um, recruit more women, uh, not only to job opportunities, but to decision making and professional levels. Now, um, as I said, angry citizen syndrome, it's something very difficult to cope with. It's like 99% uh, Wall Street to Main Street type yeah. of uh, yeah. movement yeah. that is across the border. Yeah. So this symposium's theme is very correct. We have to sort of analyze, look deep into the uh, solutions, package of solutions, so that the young generation will know that the focus is there, that we care. Um, we are, as a Filipino, uh, uh, finance minister said, we are the steward and stewardess uh, for better civilization for them, not for ourselves. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, just before I answer the question directly, I, I would like to say that I think we are at a historical new today, um, or in this generation, rather compared to where we had been in the past. And the te technological breakthroughs following the the Industrial Revolution has have made it so. And um, in, in that sense, the, the people are now moving to the age where they're staying uh, uh, longer and longer benefiting from social benefits while being unable to uh, be part of the labor force. And uh, as a result of that, or in conjunction with that, if you want, we're also having, we're also seeing uh, a reducing uh, uh, number, of, uh, number of children per family as well, which are meant to be in the Bismarckian system um, supporting these, these social benefits. So in, in this sense, I think we also should start to question um, whether the, the political systems that we have in place are indeed the ones that uh, are conducive to, um, um, uh, to making the right decisions, in, the right economic decisions from an economic standpoint. And uh, I, I don't mean this in a, in a truly revolutionary fashion, but I do think that there is something to being able to have a um, constructive political debate based on facts rather than um, uh, waiting until you hit the wall and then having to, uh, to have a sharp turn and a sharp correction. I, I think even what's going on this week is, uh, and, and in the previous weeks in, here in Europe, is, uh, is showing that that, can, uh, uh, that, that that is almost always a suboptimal solution. The, um, uh, uh, Mr. President uh, spoke about the um, the importance of education in this sense. And uh, I think it can be, it's a circle, whether it's a vicious circle or a virtuous circle, it's up for up to, uh, I guess, a country at its own level. And this is what's gonna bring me to, to my point that um, uh, it needs to decide. Investing more in education creates a more educated electorate, which in turn can, through a direct democracy here or uh, a representative democracy elsewhere, bring us to, um, to political outcomes and political debates that actually yield, uh, yield results which are responsible to future generations. And this is especially important in a more interconnected world where a country's problems can easily become global problems. So the question I'm asking, and uh, that's uh, hopefully something we can then debate also in the, in the breakout in the afternoon, is whether there is a role, uh, a, a more enforcing role, uh, for, um, for supranational institutions and even international institutions in this domain, be it uh, the European Union here, uh, uh, other similar alliances elsewhere, the, um, um, uh, the UN, uh, whatever it may be, and I've mentioned the Bretton Woods institutions because mm. they actually have the most leverage yeah. <laughs> in this domain and are sometimes, uh, even if reluctantly, yeah. for, for, uh, for political reasons, uh, the ones that um, help um, course correct. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, you know, in today's uh, world where um, you know technology is uh, uh, improving by the minute, by the day, you know, the one thing that's always puzzled me is the fact that uh, we have not really updated our accounting model, and uh, I think uh, it's important that. Uh, we look at this uh, challenge because we need an accounting model that captures the cost of economic activity to the environment, that captures the future cost 
of uh, uh, transactions that captures the cost amongst ourselves of uh, uh, activities. And uh, I think if we don't do this, no, on the theory that uh, what is not measured does not uh, get done, no, this fight against uh, climate change will never be uh, won. This fight against uh, uh, poverty will never be uh, won. Uh, see, we live in a world right now where the financial economy is so much bigger than the real economy. And I think we need an accounting model that captures the goods to society of activity so that we can balance uh, these things. Because after all, we all need to eat. If suddenly the world becomes all financial uh, uh, transactions, we will, uh, sooner or later, have to face up to the fact that that is just an illusion. Mm. What is real is the real economy. And therefore, we need to create models that will help us, guide us, in terms of how we reward professions, how we reward countries, how we reward economic activities on a more holistic uh, uh, basis. And I think we have the brain power in this room uh, around the countries to be able to work on that. Thank you very much indeed for that. I, I wonder if we could have the, the lights are now turned on. Uh, it's Q&A, it's over to you. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. The gentleman there in the middle, sir. Are there any other hands going up? There's one hand here. And there's another hand there, thank you. Gentleman in the middle. Thank you very much, sir. Maybe um, you could just say your name and... Yes, um, my name is Jeffrey Dolphin. Um, I am a former student of um, at the LSC in environmental economics and the issues we have been um, dealing with are um, uh, close to my interest. So um, my question to the panelists and um, Professor Inoguchi uh, more specifically is the following. Um, you have touched upon the topic of peace and you mentioned peace as a legacy of the past generation. Um, but I'm wondering about your views um, for the future prospect of this peace and the, um, the value of it, especially if we see today that some countries are flexing their muscles uh, in some parts of the world. They're, I'm talking about their military muscles. Um, second, second example, the fact that in some countries of Europe, people just do not realize the, the value of this piece or do no longer uh, have this in mind. And third, um, do you think that this piece is any way valuable um, in, or valuable in any means if um, it was built on the accumulation of financial and environmental debt. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That's one question, by the way, not three. <laughs> just, Sorry. just to be clear. <laughs> okay, is it all right uh, if I respond? Thank you very much for a very important question. I think one of the job of uh, older generation is to speak about the importance of peace. You don't just lecture how to get rich, how to live in peace and solve conflicts through diplomacy. Now Switzerland stand as, as a master of diplomacy and Europe generally uh, developed this art of diplomacy the best solution to war, or, no, best alternative to war is diplomacy. So we should all study diplomacy and to try to solve issues. The president of the Switzerland, uh, of the Swiss Federation has just talked, a very, uh, g gave us very important insights into how, to Ukraine, how we should deal with the Ukrainian issue. Well, I would, I would add to his words, four Ds, right? Disarmament de-escalation, and then you will have development. But then development could be wiped off with disasters as we have in Asia. So disaster prevention. Now I come from a country that suffered uh, enormous earthquake and tsunami, and you all helped us three years ago. So I am for those disaster prevention, disarmament, de-escalation, and development, and, and diplomacy. Now, geriatric peace, which I was about to speak, 
the, that's a very important idea. Uh, I, I hope, uh, I, hope uh, uh, I find uh, friends uh, in this argument. Um, <laughs> because if you are uh, speaking in terms of gun or butter, then people will say, well, sacrifice butter and we go for war. But now in democracy, we are now trying to raise social expenditure for elderly citizens' medicine. And therefore, we have to find always all the other kind of ways to solve problems, not by war, but through diplomacy. And you can spend millions for diplomacy. Nothing is cheap compared to, uh, nothing is, more ex uh, nothing is uh, uh, cheaper, uh, uh, no, nothing costs less uh, compared to a war. So you can spend a lot for diplomacy. And uh, uh, in this gun or medicine argument, I think uh, more countries will be leaning to putting more effort to diplomacy and peace. Thank, Thank you. you. I think I'm going to ask the gentleman here. No, 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 sorry, the gentleman behind this. <laughs> and then. I'm Nadi Godrej from India. And my question is a very simple one. Should, pe should older people have the right to vote? <laughs> I, where's the pretty seamer? Oh, well, uh, actually. I, um, I think it may be better just to give a one word answer. <laughs> yes. yes or no. What's the answer? Yes. Good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Of course, yes. Of course, yes. Great. <laughs> the third person was over there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Matt Krauser. I'm originally from Poland. I'm a student at Harvard Law School. Um, my question isn't directed at, at, it, it is directed at the panel generally. Um, so I, I think what the discussion has borne out is that there, there is a variety of challenges and there's also a need for a variety of institutional responses. And, and also further to, to what uh, Minister Kristic said about a uh, bigger role perhaps to be played by, institu by international institutions. So, so my question is whether we need uh, more flexibility in responses designed and at this international level. And, and here I'm, I'm referring more specifically to, to what we're dealing at the moment in the Ukraine. Uh, international Monetary Fund is now being actively involved in, in helping Ukraine, but at the same time, its policies for which it has been criticized for a long time of conditional help are have Sorry, somehow... Can I just stop you for a minute? Is this relevant to the clash of generations? Yes, so, so I guess my, my we... overarching question is whether we need a more, like a larger variety of institutional responses mm -hmm. in, in dealing with, with those various problems. And, and if, we're, if we're hoping for in, international institutions to deal with them, yeah. do, do we want them to be more flexible in, in how they approach uh, those challenges? Mr. Put, because you really answered this already, Mr. Purishima. And then a very quick um, response from you. Well, um, from uh, the, the area of finance, I do believe that uh, we need a stronger IMF. Because uh, in an age of uh, globalized financial uh, transactions, in an age <coughs> of uh, very sophisticated uh, derivatives, we need to make sure that we have an institution that can harmonize regulations, say, or derivatives. Because I don't want to see another global economic crisis that's the creation of this uh, sophisticated financial instruments that really has nothing to do with the real economy. That will affect our fight against poverty, our fight in improving our people's uh, lives unnecessarily. And therefore, I think we need to update uh, what was signed in the Bretton Woods Agreement, that, that the world of 1947 is totally different from the world of today. Yourself, Anika. Okay. Um, sure. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I will, I will try my best. Uh, yes, uh, there are many international global institutions that respond to clashes or crises of young people. Uh, they need to be flexible, that your suggestion. I agree. Uh, most uh, recently, we have been engaged in the United Nations in a, di in a debate of uh, post-MDGs, 
Millenn Millennium Development Goals, that is so yeah. relevant to both mm. of, these, of your countries. And also, we are the donors for MDGs. So, um, through uh, uh, post-MDGs, we may be able to focus more on girls. Now, MDG, Millennium Development Goals, but G can also stand for girls. <laughs> focus more how girls can be fed, live, go to schools, graduate from schools, find jobs, don't have to quit jobs when she has children, continue her professional life, live very long like Japanese uh, women. <laughs> so that's the new Millennium Development Goals for Girls. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a question from a gentleman here. I'm going to ask, is there a lady who can... There's a lady here and one other lady? A lady here? Okay. The last two questions will be from ladies. <laughs> Sorry, we need a microphone here. It's coming. It's coming soon. <laughs> it's come. It has come. Well, I'm Ukrainian, and I happen to have been chairman of this symposium for 24 years before we have this current distinguished chairman. My question is, if the panel think that you should have a complete change of paradigm. We live with very strong emphasis on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and in a competitive mode, which means we live uh, with the game win-lose. Should we not have the change to have also a universal declaration of human duties and live in a cooperative mode, which is win-win? Thank you. Thank you very much. V very clearly put, very important question, Mr. Kristic, first. I think this is exactly at the heart of, uh, of the issues we're facing, and I think will need to be at the heart of the solution. And, uh, the, of course, the issue of coordination between, uh, between different nations, especially in times of, of stress, and the system is stressed. It is stressed transgenerationally, so to speak, between today and tomorrow, both in terms of climate change, in terms of the... Um, again, historic levels of debt that we have uh, and that are rising, and um, uh, horizontally between, uh, in terms of inequality that we have between various parts of the world, the system is therefore um, stressed, and I think in these situations coordination is, uh, is even more difficult than, than otherwise. There are historical precedents, I think, when uh, things, have, um, uh, things have been sorted in such a way that we are now experiencing the 70th year of, uh, uh, of peace here in, uh, in uh, Western Europe. The, um, uh, I don't have a ready solution, but I think without that, we're essentially uh, going to be seeing more of uh, what we're unfortunately starting to see in, uh, now in Eastern Europe, if you want, and that wouldn't be good. Mr. Purishima? I uh, totally uh, agree. Win-win, uh, I think, is the right uh, uh, approach. But for, for that to happen, you need trust among uh, uh, countries. And I think, uh, uh, for, for example, in globalization, our problem has been we have the right goal, but we compromise. We go halfway. And therefore, we don't achieve what it truly uh, can. And therefore, you're not able to build trust among the uh, players, uh, uh, among nations. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with women. So. You agree. That's a <laughs> wonderful response. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. A lady here, a professor from Japan, I think, if I can see through the mist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Yoko Ishikura, professor uh, of uh, Hitotsubashi University. My question is, what's the role of technology? in resolving the clash of generations, because I think the, the technology works as a device between the other generations, but it can work as a solution. 
So if you could just think of, uh, tell us, share with us some specific solutions using can, technology. Can I say, I think that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Mr. Furushima, I'm coming to you. Well, technology is an enabler. It will allow us to uh, uh, reconcile the various conflicts that uh, uh, we face. It allows us to get to a win-win in many uh, situations. That's how I view technology. Well, well, thank you very much for a great insight. Um, with ITs, for example, many women can't work from home when she has to. So that's one solution. Now, in aging society, um, older people need to be cared. And it sounds kind of awful, but in fact, it's not all that awful. Some robotics really help uh, nursing the, the older uh, uh, sick, uh, ill people. So there are many solutions, and you can have all kinds of medical parameters uh, improved by technology. Um, so, uh, Japan stands for science and technology, so does Switzerland, so, may, so there's many uh, countries. I hope uh, young people uh, focusing on technology and science uh, are paid better and encouraged better so that they will be able to provide yeah. solutions. I personally think that in addition to being an enabler, um, uh, it can also be a game changer. As a matter of fact, we had a conversation over dinner last night where we discussed uh, um, uh, about microfinance essentially uh, uh, being introduced uh, through, uh, through cell phones, which is uh, 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 one aspect of things. And I think um, uh, there can be discrete uh, technological innovations which provide for discrete kind of step changes in the quality of life and in, uh, in the cost of, uh, uh, of some of the matters. So if we're talking about the, the, the clash of generations, of course, um, when we think about technology and science, we think about medicine. Um, there are also things and uh, the prolongation of the of the human life, which I think is uh, is possibly the greatest achievement of uh, of this particular generation. The uh, at the same time, I think um, uh, if we set up the the incentives in a correct way, we can also hope to see as a result of science, science and technology, a significant reduction in costs, for instance, for healthcare that can then be um, the amounts uh, or the funds of, uh, that are currently used for, for, for which can be then reallocated, for instance, to education. Thank you very much. And now a lady on my right. Good morning, my name is Madeline. I was just wondering because where, when we... Uh, where are you? Are you a uh, leader I'm, of tomorrow or a student here? Or? I'm a leader of tomorrow. I'm an American, but I'm an expatriate living in South Africa. Great. So my question relates to... So we talk about the clash of generations, and presumably this means that we're infringing on the human rights of young people. Um, but if we have these human rights, then what are the human duties that we as young people have to go along with this? And what kind of autonomy can we have in addressing and taking ownership of the kind of unseemingly um, negative situation that we're facing? Thank you very much. Wow. Um, Kuniko. A very important question. Human um, duties, yes. you said. Hmm. That's a wonderful word. Well, the young people do have duties to advance the civilization, civilization in all its aspects, inclusion, next stage of democracy, more diversity, higher uh, ideals to, to pursue. So those are the uh, goals that requires energy, passion. We have to live our ideals. We have to live our passion, mission, and action. So those are the sort of dynamics that can come only with the self-consciousness of younger generation. Of course, we also, oh, I, I, I should belong to younger generation, but uh, I mean, we all uh, wish we had that energy, but uh, I think that's very important that uh, you provide those. You're an honorary member of that generation. Oh. <laughs> Well, I surrender now, to you. <laughs> Mr. Kristich is a member of that generation. I'll keep it short. Get engaged. Get politically engaged and uh, participate in the system rather than trying to uh, fight against the system, uh, I think, because I think it's for the benefit of all and especially for the young generation. 
I think each generation is a steward of uh, our future and our past. And I think, uh, as uh, he said, we need to work with each other, engage each other to make sure that we have a better future. I'm afraid that the thought police have now turned up for the first time in 15 years. I have in front of me here on the stage a notice saying, please finish. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, it's not because we're speeding, it's that we're too slow. Can I just say three things in uh, conclusion? The first is, uh, I think with a, generalist, ish, a generational issue, from a political point of view, from my involvement in the House of Lords, working five and a half years with Margaret Thatcher and being involved before that, uh, I think you have to offer hope. And I see two groups, certainly in Britain, who don't have hope. We've had something like a million young people between the age of 16 and 24 unemployed. And when you have graduates who've worked hard for three years or four years, and there's no job, we have to create hope for them. And it seems to me, politically, uh, there are lots of things in the short term that one can do for that, but that is crucial. And secondly, there's elderly people who've already retired, and frankly, quantitative easing has been a disaster for them <laughs> because you've had zero interest rates, and their expected income in retirement was totally frustrated, and again, they have no hope. So I think the whole issue of raising interest rates to me has a very important social dimension to it in creating um, more uh, working together in our society. Uh, the second issue is um, I've struggled, uh, my special field used to be monetary economics, and I've struggled a lot with monetary and fiscal stability. And uh, if you look at a country like Britain, or if you look at the US and so on, ever since Keynes put forward a very rational argument as to why we should engage in deficit spending, if you look at the trend, you know, it's really got worse. And someday I was very involved in, for a long time, in a conference with James Buchanan. And the question to me uh, raised by this, it's difficult. But it's a question of, in the political life of our society, do we need rules which we all agree to in society and which we stick to? For example, there was in the European Union a rule that debt to national GDP shouldn't be more than 60%. First the French, then the Germans just bust it, and now, you know, Greece has got a ratio, I don't know, 170, 180%. And because I think, and let, but at the heart of that is a cultural issue. Is the society really committed to living within rules, or are we prepared to give so much discretion to politicians? I think that's an important issue. And that's come out this morning. I think the third issue came out in the first sentence of uh, Professor Kotlikoff's uh, speech to us and challenge to us, which is, that this is, above all, a moral issue. And if, for me, St. Gallen stands for one thing, it is that we cannot simply discuss political, economic, social issues as technical issues. They have to be framed within the reference of ethics and of what's right and wrong. And in that sense, when Mr. Critchett says, get involved in politics, you get involved because you believe something, not because you want to go on a gravy train. And I think that's important. So for me, uh, it's been a terrific session. Thank you for the questions. I'd like to thank each member of the panel. Would you join me in giving them a very big hand? <laughs>